I will present to you OSNAP, which is a tool about painless and massive regression tests for OCaml. Uh, so to begin with, a few words about me. So maybe you, you've seen that I was uh, marked as an intern at Nomadic Labs. So the funny thing is I submitted the talk a year ago, and at that time I was an intern, but I'm no longer an intern. I, I work as a software engineer at Nomadic Labs. If I still was an intern, it will be pretty much illegal, at least in France. I don't know about your countries. Uh, but so we are in company in France, but in Paris. Uh, we are exclusively funded by the Tezos Foundation. Uh, it's a foundation that runs the blockchain Tezos. So we mainly developed uh, the, the blockchain like with a big research and development center. So uh, the funny thing about Tezos, except the fact that it, that it is a blockchain, is we develop it in OCaml. So if you don't know OCaml, it's a functional programming language of the ML family. It was also developed in France. We like French stuff in France. Um, and I will try to give you a bit of introduction on this. So, uh, to begin with, I want to give you the story of about Bill. Uh, so, Bill is hired to, by a company to work on the blockchain Tezos. That's not the same I work on. It's a completely different blockchain, so no, no correlation between those two. So, Tezos is a 20-year-old blockchain that was written in OCaml as well and there are very little traffic on the network. But suddenly, uh, with the arrivals of the crypto camel NFTs and all that stuff, the number of users explode uh, in the blockchain, and it puts the overall performance uh, of the blockchain under great pressure. So that's where Bill arrives. He is like the savior of camel worshippers, and he needs to optimize the software so they are able to action their non-fungible tokens. So the, the problem is, if Bill makes mistakes, uh, the blockchain can collapse. And being a critical software with a lot of virtual money on it, we don't want people to lose <laughs> the virtual money. So it will be really a disaster and something that we want to avoid. OK, so uh, for Bill works, he needs to discover the code written by his predecessor and try to optimize it. So eventually, he managed to isolate a given function that is uh, some function of tree. So in OCaml, we can write a way to write a tree in an ADT is that you say that it is a, a leaf of, of an integer, for example, or either a node with a subtree. So there has been a function called sum, uh, which does the sum of the every leaves in the tree, and it was pretty naive implementation, uh, recursive. Uh, it had been there for years. Uh, the blockchain is really old. So, uh, it's not really effective. It works. In many cases, it works. Uh, eventually, you will reach uh, Stack Overflow. I mean, they had issues with Stack Overflow because it uses a lot of space on the, on the stack. So they however decided to not uh, modify the function because every time they tried, they failed, and there were many bugs. So they keep it that way. But Bill is like a master programmer. He loves the camel. He knows the camel. He knows everything about it. So he wants to optimize the function. So he will try to use the tail call optimization in the camel. And to do so, it will transform the function into a CPS uh, style function, where instead of doing naively the recursion, they will put the sub result into continuation and stuff like that. So he believes in the optimization. Uh, he wants it to be added in production. But to do so, he is asked to write tests, unfortunately. Uh, so he will write some and say that the sum of a tree with two leaves of value 0 is equal to 0, two leaves of uh, value 1 is equal to 2, and it's like, by induction, other cases would work. Like, it's functional programming, so it's, there are no issues. And people trust him. So the code is added in production. Uh, okay, however, the thing is, his code is, is bad. There, are, there is a bug in the code, and, he, and the stupid test didn't uh, realize, or at least catch the issue. So Bill will not stay forever in the industry and in this company. But what we now want to think about is how oh, could he have done it better to have a better testing of his software. So the first easier solution is to write more unit tests. Uh, but the issue with unit tests is if you write uh, the input that you like, you may not find uh, the corner cases and stuff like that will detect the error. Otherwise, you could have used uh, property-based testing, which is quite nice. It can create random inputs, but to do so, you need to, to know properties on your code. And 
There are some functions that may be really, really easy, but it can be really difficult to find uh, good properties and properties that make sense, actually. So he wasn't able to do that because Bill just discovered the, the software. But the question is now, why didn't he use OSNAP? It's exactly what we want to do. Uh, the objective of OSNAP is trying to mix the last two items and to use the random scenario generation inspired by Polyverse testing into regression test. So the first step is to get inspiration from them and to use the random generators to create scenarios for a function. Then you will execute the scenarios on a function and you will store the result on disk. And there will be a uh, regression test using the, these, uh, these scenarios and the outputs. So now that you have that, every time you try to change the function, you will, re re you will rerun the test case on new version uh, of the function, and eventually you will find unwanted ch changes in the results. So the first funny thing uh, to be able to do that is to be able to generate scenarios for a function. That's the most complicated part. Uh, so what we want to do is to be able to generate a value for each uh, type in your, each parameter in your, in your function. So we have like a type spec with, for any alpha, which will combine in a record um, a generator, a generator abstracted the type because it's just a function that creates random values for alpha. And optionally, you can have a printer to try to see what you generated and what caused the, in the outputs. So now that you have the way to generate value for each parameter, you need to be able to distinguish uh, the, the different results. So to do that, we consider uh, the textual representation of results. So we could have done many other way, like the equity function, things like that. But what we wanted to do is to like uh, use regular diff tactics on the outputs and to be able to easily see with your human eyes what was wrong. So now that you have the two, these two bricks, you can combine them into another type, which is a global specification type. Uh, it's a bit fancier type. I will explain a bit later. But Mainly, you have two cases. Either it's uh, the arrow cases, where in the recursive case, you will combine specification into specification into specification, and eventually you will finish the build with the uh, variant result. Uh, with, a, with a very simple example uh, of a function repeat that, uh, that repeats n times a, char a character, uh, if you want to create a specification, you will first say that the spec is an integer for n into a specification of a character for c. And finally, you will send it to a printer of string. So to create this specification, I use two infix combinators. The first one is like the common case, uh, trying to combine spec into another. And eventually, you have the final um, combinator that creates, that takes a specification and a result. So that's the only way to build a specification, and this way you have a world type specification for a function. Like a function is basically an input and an output. It needs to have a parameter for a function. So this way you will have at least one spec for one parameter and the result. So the, fa the fancy thing is the type right there is not an IDT for algebraic data type like it was for the tree. It's a GIDT. So on the command it's a generalized algebraic data type. Uh, it's a fancy stuff in type theory. I don't know much about it. I just use it. But it allows you to introduce uh, equation uh, on your type. So in this way, you can combine specification of integers, of character, and any other types that you want, which you cannot normally do. Like if you have an alpha list, uh, it's a list of alpha. And this way, you can tweak the type system. And like you could create a, uh, a list with different types inside. But well, now that we have that, uh, we can come back to the build example and the function sum. So if we want to create a specification for the sum function, uh, we will try first to write a generator for the inputs and a printer. So I, I did hide the implementation there, but because it's not really interesting. But let's say that you have one, a printer and a generator. You create a spec for the, for the type tree. And now that you have the spec of a tree, you can create a spec of the, the function sum. So it is a spec of a tree into a printer of integers. And now that you have that, you have a specification, you have the function, you combine them two into a test, and then you have a runner that can create the scenarios. 
So let's say that my original implementation of sum is what I believe to be true. I will create a regression test on this function. So the tool will generate a lot of inputs randomly. It will store as well the outputs of the function and it will ask you if you want to promote the snapshots. So you will create, take a snapshot of the actual state of the function uh, as we kind of believe that the function is, is right because it has been there for years. We will trust the input and outputs and promote on disk uh, the snapshot. So now that you have that, you have the regression test. And you can come back to your optimization, like Bill could have done that. And before even thinking if his function is right or, or anything, it will just run the regression test, like in the CI, everything that would catch it. And it will have some differences. So in Bill's case, uh, it didn't try to to change the output or the expected output of the function, he just wanted to change the implementation of the function. So any red or green is a really bad sign. That means that he, he broke something somewhere. So eventually, with using this regression test, he can try to incrementally and loop until he finally finds a diff that make him that makes the test pass. So in that case, it was a dumb mistake where he over, overrided a value in the continuation. But now that he created a, a good fix, the test at least will prove him right. So for, for a general workflow of OSNAP, uh, the first thing you want to do is to specify a function, which is mainly writing generators and outputs. Uh, it can be tedious, but it's mostly boilerplate code, mainly. Uh, then internally, OSNAP will generate random scenarios, it will execute the scenarios on the function and will store them on disk. And now that you have that, now that you did that, you have regression tests. So you can enter a loop of development and every time you update the function, you will execute the scenarios. Uh, if there are differences between the, the expected and actual outputs, you will ask yourself, are they intended? So if they are not, like in Bill's case, it's a bug. So you come back to the update function until you eventually get it. But you can imagine, imagine, imagine that the, the output can change, so the function can evolve in the time, so you can update only the output of the function and keep the input forever. So that's what that was about our snap. So to conclude with, uh, inspired by unit test and property based testing, we were able to automatically generate a large number of scenarios using random generators. The thing is, you can generate a lot, really a lot. It will take some time, but once you generate it once, you will never do it again. So you will read the input from disk, and it will be fast afterwards. After the first one, it will be really fast. Uh, we also abstracted the need, uh, the expertise, to extract properties from the code. Like that what I was saying earlier, can be complicated to extract properties from a code and really good privileges. And uh, with that, we are able to like black box uh, testing a function. So at a, at a very low level, we can do black box testing. So I think that's nice in that way. And finally, we were able to save and version the state of a function. That way, we can prevent unwanted changes in the future, or at least we hope to be able to prevent these changes. Um, well, we have several ways to improve the tool. So the first one is I created another framework of testing. I mean, in my, in my company uh, where I work, in the real Tezos, we have like six to eight different framework of testing. So we don't want to add another one. And people like <laughs> will just uh, cancel the, the pull request. So I can do that. So a good thing will be to try to plug the tool into existing one. Uh, like uh, in OCaml, we have QCheck, which is very popular. It's like the the quick check implementation in OCaml. So I could like to plug the my ideas into the tool. Uh, secondly, uh, regression tests are not very resilient to change. So it's a bit unfortunate. But if you create input for a function, it's for a given type, a given function type. So if you change the function type, you will not be able to reapply the same inputs on in the function. So either you have a kind of way to migrate one input to another one, like to map all the inputs, or either you have to drop uh, the snapshot and all the inputs. So that's a bit uh, unfortunate, but 
that's what it is. Uh, and finally, um, I tried to use random generators to try to create more inputs and find the edge cases and things like that. But the thing is, you can, you can not rely completely on a generator. So if you give a generator of tree that only generates a leaf, always, you wouldn't catch the issue. And it's something that can happen. You can create a generator that just gives the same pass and again and again think you're right where just the scenarios are just dumb. And one way to go around this issue would be to like use fuzzing techniques and stuff like that. Like in OCaml, we have Bisect PPX, which is a tool that uh, can analyze the code coverage of your code. And so we'd like to incrementally try to improve the code coverage and the execution pass, like really like the fuzzing techniques. So uh, that's what, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope that you found it interesting. And if you have any question about the tool or even OCaml, I don't know, how, how do you like it? <laughs> yeah, let, let's give a warm round of applause to Valentin. Thank you for the talk. Do we have any questions? Yeah, question, lots of questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so do you actually store the inputs on in the file, or do you just store the, the hash for the generator? Um, we store the inputs. We store the inputs. Uh, at first, we thought about trying to like keep the seed yeah, that's and the number of inputs, but the thing is you can change your generator. So we really wanted to keep the inputs and to have like a relation between the input and the output that you can easily see with your own eyes. I mean, in bigger function, it will be complicated because the, the value can be really big, stuff like that. But that's a show that we made to keep the input on disk. But, but you could, re yeah, okay, but if you, yeah, if you change the generator, it's different. But like yes. If you had the same generator, you could just regenerate the inputs. Yes, you could. Okay. The thing is, if you change it, you, it's kind of complicated. But it takes time. Hmm? But it takes time. Yeah, 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 but I, I reading also, from file also re takes reading time. inputs <laughs> from a file only takes uh, takes a lot of time. So, that's two possible solutions, I guess. I mean, uh, there are all pros and cons in both. So, I don't think there's the best solution between the the two. I don't know if you have any opinion about that. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking, like, yeah. No, I think, uh, yeah, you can't change the generator. So that would be my second question. How did you know that the things that you generated were interesting? Uh, but that's the problem with generators to begin with, I guess. It's a problem with generators. You don't know. It's like why, it's why I wanted to add, like, fuzzing techniques in there, because, like, uh, it's complicated. Like, for instance, if you... If the function, the first thing that the function is is to say that uh, if my ta my value is valid regarding some specification, and you have a dumb generator that create, that just generate random values that never pass the first if, the generator is just dumps. It just it's only one branch in the code, so it's the issue with generator. Related to the generation, there is. Um there is one technique, I don't know if there are frameworks in our camo for concolic testing, which is basically, well, I'm going to summarize it wrong, but um, is what if you could do the generation for property-based testing, but at the same time you're doing the analysis of the code, and instead of trying to guess, because that's basically what we are doing with fuzzing and generation, we are trying to guess and hoping it's going to cover all the branches, with concolic testing is actually trying to understand the code and say, oh, I need this input to be more than zero or less than zero. Mm -hmm. Because the, the approach with snapshots is very interesting, but for me, the limitation is exactly on the generation. So you need to improve the generation and concolic testing is one approach, but uh, it's symbolic execution. So there are a lot of complexities in there, mm -hmm. but if there's something in your camo, it could be a good pairing for the generation part. Um, the thing is, you know, Camel, all these matters are quite new. I mean, uh, the Camel community love the academic stuff and the formal ver verification and stuff. So their energy is more like in the, the coke, the proof assistant, stuff like that. Uh, and uh, the language is also very large with a lot of features. Like OCaml is for objective Camel. So there's a lot of things, you know, Camel, so it's really complicated to have a code analysis on this kind of stuff. but. More and more, we have more work on this and like uh, project research progress on this. So eventually, one time, one day, I hope.
So when you're testing, do you ultimately compare the pretty printed strings? Or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's a choice. It's a choice. Um, I mean, otherwise you'd have to pass an equality yourself, or because structural equality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work. it could have been a, another solution to use equality, but uh, what we really wanted to do is to be able to see in the diff, like in the pull request of the diff right uh, alongside, and see what changed. And m we could use both. I mean, optionally, you could add an equality that really does uh, the check, the comparison, and you just print the results. That could be possible. And it will be like more robust, I guess. Yes. OK, thank you. OK, any more questions? OK, I think that's it. So once again, let's give a warm round of applause to Ronto. Thank you. Thank you for your talk.